Well, well, well. Edward Theodore Gein, born 68 years before the FBI would even coin the term serial killer, but you surely fall under that umbrella, even though your body count seems a bit underwhelming. Just two, I see here, for a Mary Horgan and a Bernice Warden. But considering the cornerstone of good detective work back in the early 1900s were just hunches and probabilities, I'm sure you got away with plenty. Because there's definitely a lot to unpack about a man that likes to wear other people's skin in the comforts of his own home. Wouldn't you say, Mr. Gein? So where should we start? Yes, definitely your mother, born Augusta Wilhelmine Lerke. She married your father, George Philip Gein, in the winter of 1900. They had your older brother, Henry, just a year later, and that's where things start falling apart, as your mother shortly after realizes she had married a lazy drunk that couldn't hold a job. But being raised on the old Lutheran beliefs that any acts and even thoughts that were sinful would doom that person to an eternity of damnation. Well, unfortunately for her, Divorce was a sin, so your mother stayed with your father simply as a good, God-fearing woman. And as the years dragged on, your father's alcoholism only got worse, and so did your mother's resentment of him, which somehow mutated into an utter disdain for all men in general. But even if she was stuck in this bad marriage, your mother had always dreamed of a daughter, so she would allow your worthless dad to impregnate her once again. And on August 27 of 1906 in La Crosse, Wisconsin, you could imagine the sheer disappointment in the delivery room when you popped out, Mr. Gein. Man, I bet she was pissed. But she wasn't about to live with three vile men, so she was going to do whatever it took to beat the living evil out of both her sons. And that's exactly what she did, verbally and physically. But most of her energy was reserved for you, wasn't it? She was overbearing towards you more so than Henry. I could only imagine how confusing it would be for a child to be abused and then protected, shamed and then uplifted all by the same person. And in your case, you developed an abnormal, debilitating need for your mother. You worshipped her. So it's definitely interesting how the mind works sometimes under heavy emotional trauma. Now your father could have been your savior, your hero, but instead was spineless when it came to dealing with your mother. But man, he sure did find the courage to take out his frustrations on you boys. Remember when he pounded your head so hard that you couldn't hear anything anymore except for ringing? In 1913, you were just seven years old when you had your first ejaculation. Now, what did you see that aroused you? Was it A, a cute girl? Was it B, a cute boy? Or was it C, watching your parents slaughter a hog. And of course, disturbingly, the answer was C. You ejaculated in your pants before you even knew what the feeling was. And in the following year, your mother decided that the sinful city life wasn't how she was going to raise her boys. So your family packed up and moved to a 195 acre farm in Plainfield. Plainfield, Plainfield, Plainfield. Well, now wait a minute. Your nickname is the Butcher of Plainfield. Well, I guess we finally arrived at your stomping grounds. So audience, from this point forward, your discretion is advised. So while attending grade school, you began to be more self-conscious about a couple of perceived physical setbacks, and that's been your one lazy eye and the lesion on your tongue that caused you to speak a bit funny, which caused you to be a bit shy around the other kids. But that wasn't the whole reason, was it, Mr. Gein? It was your mother that didn't like it when you socialized with any kids. Any attempts at making a friend made her furious. It's as though she was afraid to lose you. You would think that after all the ungodly punishments she handed out, she would be glad to be rid of your presence for any period. Yet quite the opposite. Now, Mr. Gein, I think she too had an unhealthy attachment to you as well. If that, disgustingly, makes you feel any better. 
But now let's jump to 1918. So what does that make you? About 12 years old? Now just tell me to stop if this is too embarrassing. Mm-hmm. So you wind up in the mm-hmm. classic boy's nightmare. Your mother walks in on you while masturbating in the bathtub. Mm-hmm. And I bring up this story just to let you know, if you're not aware, that what your mother did after catching you yanking your hog isn't what usually happens. Normal mothers would not grab their son's erect penis and proclaim it as the curse of man. You do know that, right? And so this undoubtedly shaped a young Edward Theodore Gein into a quiet recluse that obeyed orders, took his earful, took his lumps, and somewhere before you were even a teenager, I think your brain stopped progressing. Maybe it was the constant blows to the head from your father, but either way, there was a childlike way about you moving forward. But there was also a monster growing deep within as well. So nothing more eventful happened in the terms of your schooling. You were just academically average and you dropped out completely in the eighth grade at just 14 years old. But you did take away the love of reading, which I will share with everyone, your favorite subjects soon enough. So as you were growing into a man, your mom made you promise something that was truly unfair. She told you to remain a virgin till the day you die because sex was a sin that would send you straight to hell. And you didn't question it, at least not out loud anyways. But at 20 years old, the fact that your mom and dad were sinners just by having you and the human race in general had to sin not to go extinct must have crossed your mind. And it seems to me anyways, like the only thing she feared more than God was some no good hussy sleeping with you. Like if I can't have my son's virginity, then no one can. Well, at least you both will always have that one day. She gave you one hard tug in the tub. Now we can fast forward throughout your 20s because there seemed to be nothing of note to mention besides the daily toilings of farm work. So let's jump to 1937. You're now 31 years old, a pretty advanced age in those days, not to have a wife and a family of your own. But the next three years were very hard for your family as your father was pretty much just a drunken invalid. Not only that, he was literally drinking away the family's earnings that caused the financial strain, forcing you boys to seek employment in the big, sinful city, which I'm sure drove your mother nuts. But it was either that or starve. But in 1940, the one thing that eased the family's problems tremendously, sadly, was your father's death, succumbing to pneumonia at the age of 66, and your mother, in true Augusta fashion, cursed him every step of the way to the grave, making sure her boys knew that he was a weak man that was going straight to hell. All the while, you and your brother Henry, by this time, were developing quite the reputation with the city folk as fine, trustworthy hired hands as you both worked hard at the various jobs, mainly as handymen. Henry stuck to that line, but you would begin to also accept work as a babysitter, in which you found a lot of enjoyment, because in your own words, you felt kids were so much easier to relate to. And now we arrive in 1944. Does that year ring a bell? You're 38 now, and Henry was 43, when you reported to the police that after you and your brother successfully contained a marsh fire, he was then nowhere to be seen, and you needed help to find him. So you escort the police to the marsh, not too far from your house. But oddly though, you walk them directly to Henry in the midst of where the fire was. And unfortunately, your brother was dead. And when the police inspected his body, there were no signs of him being burned, nor were his clothes even charred, inconsistent with ever being in or close to a fire. But it was poor Henry's head that sustained quite a bit of bumps and bruises. And when the coroner finished his autopsy, he ruled Henry's death was caused by asphyxiation, like someone knocked him unconscious and then choked him to death. Now here's where your childlike demeanor and reputation amongst the townspeople saved your skin. Nobody 
including the police, could believe that you were capable of something like that. And anyways, you and your brother got along fine, so why would you do it anyways? Right, Mr. Gein? It couldn't be that Henry started to openly criticize you and your mother's relationship, could it? That your attachment to each other was, well, creepy and unhealthy to him. I'm sure that made you upset, but not enough to kill your own brother now. But I think your mother, I would say, probably had a motherly instinct that you had something to do with it. But motherly instincts aside, she knew you were reading books on head shrinking, grave robbing, and assortment of books on human anatomy, and I know it doesn't seem odd to you, Mr. Gein, but trust me when I tell you, it's very odd reading material for the majority of us, and I can tell you with utmost conviction that she was well aware that you were not like the other boys, and given how religious your mother is, what's worse than murder? How about her child? killing her other child and it's no wonder that over the next year her health would fail tremendously bouts of fainting would keep her in and out of the hospital where she would eventually have her first stroke and at that point she was just a shell of herself and by the end of the year your mother would suffer another stroke and pass away at the age of 67 and from that day on you were just a shell of a shell of yourself as well you continued into the city to do your odd jobs here to make some ends meet though gradually you allowed your appearance to degrade and you appeared more like a tramp your hygiene suffered as well because people even from a distance would be offended by your stench but at this point nothing really mattered to you anymore as everyone you ever really knew was gone and the only person that really mattered had just died you missed her so much that you would even frequent her grave and weep. You even returned one night in the cover of darkness with a shovel, dug up your mother's decomposed corpse and held her in your arms. Before, holding her head between your hands, looking at her withered face, and then twisting her head off and taking it home. Finally, that book about shrinking heads, basically a method for preserving skin, came to use and it's about this time also you start boarding up rooms in your house to create quote-unquote museums but we'll get to that you start visiting cemeteries as many as 40 but without any type of you know like what you did with your mom but you were just doing some research because it's no coincidence that when you start digging up bodies again they just happened to be women around your mother's age that were just freshly buried. A lot of staking out had to be done to achieve something like that, I'm sure. And you were able to unearth nine more bodies over time. And each time, the corpse would arouse you. You would masturbate at the site. But that was just a bonus because the primary goal was to procure some of that skin that you would take home with you and preserve. And interestingly, that it was this time also that the police were swamped with a slew of missing persons cases. Now, you wouldn't know anything about that, would you, Mr. Gein? And no matter the police hunches and probabilities, they were nowhere near looking in your direction. Yet. So now it's 1951, and you're at the prime age of 45. You've cleaned yourself up a bit because much of your sorrow and self-loathing was appeased a bit by your necrophilia that was until you walked into a bar owned by a middle-aged woman named mary hogan and damn it her resemblance to your mother was uncanny except she was not a god-fearing woman and had a reputation for having some loose morals but never mind all that you kept staring at her and she let you as she went about her business soon after that day you would be digging up another grave this time of a 51 year old woman who had just been buried earlier that day you pleased yourself at the side of the body and little did mary hogan know this grotesque act had just bought her a little more time at life and people would continue to go missing in plainfield and the police were still scratching their heads about it but after three years Mary Hogan's time was up. In 1954, you walk into her bar again, and she goes missing. All that was left was a pool of blood next to an empty shell casing from a 22 caliber gun. Needless to say, 
Plainfield plainly had a killer on the loose as well as a nut job digging up graves and desecrating bodies, and the community was terrified. I'm thinking you probably felt unstoppable, like Superman, with your disguise as a mild-mannered simpleton that couldn't hurt a fly. Until 1957, you're now 51. Maybe your old age made you a bit sloppy because that year you would walk into the International Harvest Product Shop to inquire about buying some antifreeze from the shop owner, 58-year-old Bernice Warden. She rings you up and then she disappears, just like Mary Hogan did three years prior. It might have been prudent for you to do a little research on Bernice Warden beforehand because she was the mother of Deputy Frank Warden, and you better believe this was very personal. Not that Frank had to do any real detective work of hunches and probabilities, because again, next to a pool of blood was the empty shell casing of a 22 caliber gun. And a receipt for antifreeze made out to that of Eddie Gein, still on the counter. Deputy Warden, with no time to grieve about his missing mother, alongside the sheriff, found themselves on your 195-acre farm, staring intently right at your house. They found a way in through a back opening through the kitchen. Now, excuse me, Mr. Gein, I just need to warn the audience again real quick. Get your vomit buckets ready. So here we should all pray that we will never, ever know how it was to be Deputy Frank Warden that day. They pried open one of your boarded up museums and found his mother Bernice hanging upside down from a ceiling beam tied from the ankles. She was described as being split open from her vagina down to her sternum in a manner like field dressing a deer. Her head was also decapitated and seemingly discarded nearby. Now Mr. Gein, you must understand how fucked up that is, right? What if someone did that to your beloved mother? Oh, of course. It only hurts when it can be related to you, huh, you piece of shit. Police would eventually uncover several unidentified skeletal remains within your rooms and buried around your property. Some of the skulls were even affixed to your bedpost, which I assume you needed in order to jack off. A box of random organs was found, and I guess you fancied yourself as a bit of a woodworker, as you made some furniture out of bones and skin. And of course there was the preserved, withered head of your mother, a technique you were utilizing frequently, because what they found next gave a glimpse into the depravity of your mind. They found what appeared to be a whole suit made of pieced together human skin, with breasts attached around like a vest. These were the parts you were cutting up from the dug up corpses. And then there were the numerous masks. You were skinning your victim's faces so you could wear it over your own face. You then frolicked around your house, garbed in this horrifying apparel, pretending to be your mother. Does that even register to you how sick that is? <laughs> Who the fuck am I kidding? You lost your mind ages ago. 